Go look at Vladimir Putin in 1995 and you'll see a 43 year old unemployed bureaucrat. He had a totally unremarkable career and a pretty unremarkable family. He even looked unremarkable. He's trim, standing about 5 foot 7 and slightly balding. Now skip forward 4 years and he is the president of Russia. Fast forward to now and he's been in charge of Russia for 22 years. He exercises absolute control over the entire country and he just declared war on Ukraine. This isn't just an overview of the Russia-Ukraine war. It's a complete breakdown of Putin, Russia, and global politics. How all of these moving parts led to what we're seeing today. Vladimir Putin grew up in a middle-class family in St. Petersburg. Putin was something of a hooligan. He spent a lot of time on the streets and he got into fights a lot. He was always small and fairly thin. So he developed something of a honey badger syndrome. He didn't care. If you insulted him in the slightest or made even the smallest threat, Vladimir Putin was ready to throw down. Eventually, two things really turned his life around. The first was that he got involved in martial arts, specifically judo. And this was a big turning point as it introduced order and discipline into his life. The other big turning point for him was the release of a movie called The Shield and the Sword. The film was about a Soviet secret agent in World War II who goes behind enemy lines in Nazi Germany. It was a total hit in the Soviet Union. People went wild for it, including Vladimir Putin. He was obsessed with it and Putin decided that he wanted to be like the main character. So at age 16, he walks into a KGB office and he says, I want to be an agent. So obviously it doesn't work that way, but they kind of like this kid. So an officer comes out and sits down with him for a few minutes and Putin gets to ask him a few questions. And he tells Putin that they only recruit qualified candidates from universities and the army. So Putin asks the officer, if I go to university, what would be the best thing to study to get into the KGB? And the officer tells him he should study law. So Vladimir Putin has his goal and he pulls it off. He gets into Leningrad State University and in his fourth year, he is indeed recruited by the KGB. So he graduates and emerges as a counterintelligence first lieutenant. And counterintelligence meant he would be staying in St. Petersburg, not going abroad. His job was to create relationships with normal people and get them to turn in their neighbors who might be doing things that the Soviet Union did not like. So that's what he's doing and he plugs along like that for nine years. And there might have been a personal reason why he wasn't sent abroad. The Soviet Union didn't like to send unmarried agents abroad because they thought they could be blackmailed or seduced. And at the time, Putin was unmarried. But at the age of 30, he finally does get married. And just a year later, he's promoted to major and sent to the School of Foreign Intelligence in Moscow. It's basically a boot camp for foreign spies. And this looks like it's going to be his big break. He's going to get to live his secret agent dream. Well, while he's studying at this boot camp, he comes home for a small break to St. Petersburg. And he gets in a stupid fight with some guys on the metro. And in this fight, he breaks his arm. So he comes back with this broken arm and they know he got into a fight. And this would alter his trajectory in the KGB. As one of his friends later said, he has a fault, which is objectively bad for the special services. He takes risks. One should be more cautious. And so he doesn't get sent internationally. He really just continues to be a paper pusher. But being the hardworking guy he is, he gets to work and puts his head down. And over time, he gets promoted, specifically to one of the commanding officers in a small town of Dresden. And things would continue like that for some time, but everything would change in 1989. People are in the streets celebrating and protesting, and there was a Germany security and intelligence apparatus called the Stasi, parallel to the KGB in Dresden. So one of the first things the protesters do is break into the Stasi offices. Putin sees this and figures the KGB offices are next, and he's right. The crowd starts moving down the street towards their offices, and he really doesn't want to get his office ransacked. It would be disastrous for his career if the offices were destroyed on his watch. So as more and more protesters continue to gather, he calls up the Soviet military base in Dresden and says, hey, we need some backup over here. And they reply, we can't use force without authorization from Moscow. He says, okay, then call it in and ask for authorization. 
But when he calls back a few minutes later, the officer in charge tells him, quote, Moscow is silent. Putin felt totally betrayed by this. He later said, I had the feeling then that the country was no more, that it had disappeared. It became clear the union was failing. It was a deadly, incurable disease called paralysis, a paralysis of power. And from then on, he was committed to doing all that he could to ensure that Russia was never paralyzed or powerless again. Of course, by connecting this to current events, Putin sees NATO's expansion towards Russian borders as a threat. With Ukraine in talks of joining the NATO alliance, Russia would be in a position where their enemies are at their doorstep. Now back to the crowd in Dresden. The protesting is heating up outside the KGB headquarters, and Putin is in very real danger. But besides a lock gate and a few men with pistols, there was no defense. They were basically unarmed. So what would you do in this circumstance? Well, Putin walks out of the building slowly and deliberately. He addresses the people at the head of the crowd. He speaks quietly and says, this house is strictly guarded. My soldiers have weapons and I gave them orders. If anyone enters the compound, they are to open fire. And then without another word, he turns back around and calmly walks back inside. The crowd thinks better of it and they disperse. This is a really bold bluff by Putin, and it actually pays off. It's one of the first times he shows a real sense of action and leadership in a tense situation. After this incident, the KGB offices in Dresden are not around for much longer. They close up shop and everyone heads back to Russia. When Putin gets back, it's a very tough employment environment. This is a really rapid transition period for Russia. You have the Soviet Union collapsing and everything's pretty much changing. And then you have this new guy, a mayor by the name of Anatoly Sovchak, that comes in and promises open democratic and free market reforms. One problem with the revolutions is throwing out the old guys and putting in new guys. With newer guys, you don't have anyone who knows how to do the basic governing to keep the lights on and the trains running. And Sobchak doesn't want to make that mistake. He's supposed to be this reformer, but many of the people he employs are old guard Soviets, KGB guys, and communist bureaucrats. One of the first KGB guys that Sobchak hires is Vladimir Putin. After that, Putin begins to slowly step up the ladder. And why? Well, he was known as a brutally hard worker. He was efficient and tireless. And just like in the KGB, he was valued as someone reliable because he was not ambitious. Instead, he seemed like a loyal, humble, quiet guy who kept his head down. You knew you would get all the credit for everything Putin did. So he starts rising up the ranks, and three years later, in 1994, Putin becomes the deputy mayor. And it turns out Putin's boss, Sobchak, is pretty much a rising star. He's a really good smooth talker, and he's basically one of those classic politicians. Sort of like the anti-Putin. Putin likes to get things done. Sobchak likes to talk a lot. And you can see him rising in popularity and stardom by promising all these new reforms and changes coming to Russia, but that doesn't last forever. His policy of using experienced bureaucrats was a pretty good idea, but he took it way too far. And the result was an administration with a bunch of ex-Soviet guys that ended up not being very different from the system that preceded it. It was incredibly corrupt, and in 1996, Sobchak loses re-election. This leaves Vladimir Putin once again without a job or any serious prospects. He's 43 years old and strongly considering opening up a law practice or becoming a judo teacher. But he doesn't. Instead, he gets offered a job in Moscow by the federal government. He's hired as the deputy chief of the Presidential Property Management Department, and it's a pretty low-level job. But then, a familiar pattern starts to re-emerge. He consistently gets promoted and gets higher and higher appointments until finally in 1998, he gets appointed to become the head of the FSB, which is Russia's new intelligence organization. The FSB was still Soviet-style bureaucracy, bloated and very corrupt. So the president, Boris Yeltsin, needed someone who would be loyal, disciplined, and could resist corruption. Vladimir Putin seemed like an excellent choice. He gets in there and follows orders. He fires a bunch of officers, abolishes outdated departments, and replaces them with new and needed ones. 
He's loyal, he's a company man, and he's there to do his job as the head of the FSB. Putin really starts integrating himself with Boris Yeltsin. The first reason is he's doing a good job. But there's also another reason, and it's really important to Yeltsin. So there's these groups of old regime activists that want to overthrow Yeltsin. And of course he doesn't like that. So Yeltsin needs somebody to go on TV, calm people's nerves, and discourage the activists from making an actual attempt. So Putin, in his very straightforward manner, goes on TV, gives a summary of the situation, and declares, those who violate the Constitution and try to undermine Russia's state system by unconstitutional methods with the use of force will run up against appropriate resistance. This is something you can be sure of. This restores confidence in the government and earns Putin some more points with Yeltsin. And the timing is good because at this point, Yeltsin is nearing the end of his second term as president, and constitutionally, he couldn't run again. Putin played his cards just right to be in this position. It's not like he was competing with other people he worked for. In fact, it was the opposite. He provided consistent results without wanting any of the credit. If Putin was to gain any power in Russia, he knew it would be directly from the source. He didn't need to be in competition with anybody or break any walls down. He simply needed to build a foundation of trust so compelling the keys to the kingdom would be placed in his hands. Power is a lot like real estate. It's all about location, location, location. The closer you are to the source, the higher your property value. Centuries from now, when people watch this footage, who will they see smiling just at the edge of the frame? So help me God. Congratulations. Just like Frank Underwood from House of Cards, Putin was always in the frame with Yeltsin, increasing the value of his real estate as he got closer and closer. And throughout Russian history, it was very common to see ongoing rulers prosecuted and even executed once they were out of power. So Yeltsin, who was worried about this, and when deciding who to support to succeed him as president, his number one priority was who's going to be loyal to me. Who can I be sure will protect my personal safety and keep me out of jail? And he felt that person would be Vladimir Putin. So he names Putin to be his prime minister. Now Yeltsin was old and in poor health, and he was still setting the agenda to a large extent. But Putin was functionally in control of Russia's day-to-day -day governing. At the time, Russia was fighting a war within its own borders in a region called Chechnya. Now Russia is a majority Christian, specifically Russian Orthodox nation, but the region of Chechnya is in Russia and is majority Muslim. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, some people decided to rise up there and become independent. Russia was of course not okay with this, so they sent in troops. And you have to remember, Putin is a guy that believes in law and order. So it enraged him that these separatists were separating from Russia. And what enraged him even further was the fact that the war wasn't going too well. So the first thing he did as prime minister was fly down to the war zone. It's a really compelling image and sets him apart from Yeltsin, who could never go down to an active military zone, being the old man that he is. The collateral damage from this escalation was creating a really brutal humanitarian nightmare. Schools and hospitals were getting bombed along with military targets. So the press is really getting after him on this decision. But then something surprising starts to happen. Putin's popularity starts skyrocketing. The war in Chechnya was really unpopular, but that was in part because they were losing, and the Russian people really didn't like that. They used to be a part of this global superpower, the Soviet Union, that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the global superpower of today, the United States. Putin is promising a real chance at victory, and the early signs were that it was working to a certain degree, which reflects really well on Putin. You don't actually need me to stand for anything, you just need me to stand to be the strong man, the man of action. So now things are going great for Yeltsin's plan to have Putin be the new president, but Yeltsin had a knack for showmanship, and he didn't want to leave anything to chance. So he pulls off one last brilliant move as the president of Russia. The election was going to be held in June of the following year, and Yeltsin couldn't run again. And so this was going to mark the first democratic, peaceful transfer of power in Russia's history. On Russia's most popular holiday, New Year's Eve, Yeltsin gives a speech, and he says, quote, 
I have heard people say more than once that Yeltsin would cling to power as long as possible, that he would never let go. That is a lie. Then he said that he would peacefully step down, but he wouldn't wait until June. He said Russia should enter the new millennium with new politicians, new faces, new people who are intelligent, strong, and energetic. While we, those who have been in power for many, many years, must leave. He announces that he's stepping down effective immediately and naming Vladimir Putin as his successor and interim president. A new leader for a new millennium is genius propaganda. Putin's popularity begins rising, but it really takes hold after that showcase was displayed on New Year's Eve. When Putin runs for president, he doesn't really even campaign. His form of campaigning is to go down to the war zone and be filmed interacting with Russian troops. When election day arrives a few months later, he was elected in a landslide in a free and fair election. Vladimir Putin was an unemployed former bureaucrat who thought about becoming a judo teacher. Instead, he became the most powerful man in Russia, with thousands of nuclear weapons at his disposal. Putin was never promised the presidency, nor did he campaign to get there. Instead, he was placed there by luck, consistency, and being at the right place at the right time. Putin pretty much followed the same playbook as Frank Underwood. Get close to the source of power and wait for your opportunity. Yes, here we go again. Secretary of State, that's what I wanted. That's all I wanted. That's what I was promised. And now, here I am, president of these United States. Power is a lot like real estate, remember? So help me God. So help me God. So power can be transferred from one person to another, but it can't be destroyed. So Putin has power in his hands now, and he's going to do anything to keep it from leaving. The era of Putin had just begun. Remember the war in Chechnya? Well, Putin thought if they didn't put an immediate end to it, people would be emboldened by it, and Russia would come apart piece by piece. So he favored going into Chechnya and stamping out this rebellion at its source. But the public wasn't so sure. They didn't like the war and they didn't want to see it escalate. So Putin was paralyzed. But then he got a gift from the Chechen rebels in the early morning of September 4th, 1999. An enormous explosion leveled an apartment building, killing 64 people and injuring 133 others. Over the next few weeks, multiple other bombings took place, killing hundreds of people. And as you can imagine, the Russian government points to the Chechens as the culprit. And this puts the public in a full-blown panic. People get really, really upset when their nation is under attack. So the popularity of going to war with Chechnya is actually on the rise. Three days later, on September 23rd, something very strange happens in the early hours of the morning. A bus driver in a city called Ryazan, southeast of Moscow, noticed a white car parked outside of his apartment building. There was a young woman standing outside the vehicle, a man was inside the vehicle, and another man who had been taking something inside the apartment building. And so he called the local police. When the police showed up and investigated, the car was gone, but they found a massive bomb in the basement of the apartment building. The apartment building was evacuated, the local bomb squad was called in and they could defuse it. The man who saw the situation unfold was able to give a detailed description of what the bombers looked like. And then good luck struck again when a local telephone operator overheard a caller telling someone, And that sounds pretty incriminating. So they're able to trace the call and they show up to arrest them. And they match the description given by the bus driver. But there's one problem. They're not Chechen rebels. They're not even Chechen. They're ethnic Russians. And furthermore, they're badge-carrying FSB agents. So once the word gets out, the director of the FSB talks to some reporters and says, But no one seemed to know about this. Not the mayor, not the governor, not the local police, and not the bomb squad. In fact, the local bomb squad there had undercut this whole story. 
They swore that they had tested the chemicals and it was indeed a live bomb. And not only that, but the chemical they tested positive for in this bomb was RDX, a chemical produced by the Russian military. So all in all, this government explanation of this was just a test. That's why it was carried out by FSB agents. This doesn't seem to add up at all. And so you have to ask yourself, is it possible that Putin had been orchestrating these bombings to boost his popularity and give him more cover for an all-out war in Chechnya? So these bombings, they first started when Putin first became prime minister, and nobody benefited more from it than Putin did. So Putin could have orchestrated these bombings in order to legitimize the military actions in Chechnya. The road to power is paved with hypocrisy and casualties. Never regret. So you either have to do things others can't do by being extremely talented, or you have to do things others won't do by being ruthless. Putin's former finance minister, Mikhail Kyasinov, summed it up pretty well when asked if the Russian government was behind the attacks. He said, quote, I don't know, I don't know, and I don't want to believe that it could be true. And that was the attitude basically everyone took. They didn't want to believe it, so they didn't. It turns out the Russian people, and just people in general, don't care much about history. Putin looks powerful and they like that. And this is something Putin has done well for his entire career. It's not just the rich trappings of power, the palaces, and everything else, but he also goes out of his way to appear physically strong. You've probably seen some of the pictures. He's also had himself filmed doing judo. Humans, they have this very ancient and tribal desire to follow powerful and strong people. And in the Western world, we kind of laugh at stuff like this. But in reality, we're not much different. You can see this in the presidential motorcade. Is it really necessary that we have five vehicles following the president at all times? And you can see this again in just all the media write-ups about presidents, how they're strong or their athletics. So in reality, we're not really much different from Russia or North Korea in that sense. And it's worth keeping in mind. Okay, now back to Putin. After his inauguration, the first thing he does is take over the press. There are these TV channels that mock him nonstop. They create caricatures of this tiny little bald man who is too small and too weak to run Russia. So he sends in the police and makes some arrests. And the government takes control of all three major television networks in Russia. Now these charges that he's making are technically true. The 90s in Russia were wild. Communism was collapsing and the new economic order was totally chaotic. Until the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia had been completely shut off from the rest of the world. The people didn't have access to foreign music, foreign TV, or foreign movies. So all of a sudden, the leash was cut and you could do whatever you wanted. So the Russian people, guess what they did? They did whatever they wanted. It was chaotic, it was anarchy, you took what you could get, and so everyone who was involved in business was guilty of tax evasion, bribery, and a handful of other crimes. So yes, these people are guilty of crimes, but so is everyone else. And that's not why they were being arrested. They were being arrested for broadcasting things that Putin didn't like. One of the reasons he can do this is because he has proof on everyone. He was head of the FSB. He headed up an effort to make sure they had total access to all financial information. No one thought much of it, but now that he's president, Putin has the proof to prosecute whoever he wants. He knows everything about everyone, and yet very few people know anything about him. Another thing Putin does early on is build a political team out of people he could trust. To him, trust was just as important as your capabilities and he kept his friends extremely close to him. His political team began to be known as the St. Petersburg clan, where he would take all of his friends from St. Petersburg and bring them into his team. And they often were not bureaucrats, they were just his friends. They're like judo teachers and people that he already knew. He also begins to modernize the military. He's taking care of the uncomfortable stuff first. His biggest act was to pass some economic reforms. Add to that the fact that oil prices were rapidly rising and Russia has a ton of oil. And you have a really good scenario for economic development in Russia. 
and by extension, the GDP doubled during his first actual year in office. Unemployment goes down, income goes up, and the Russian government can pay off its debt ahead of schedule. I'm going to pause right here because this is really important when understanding the current leverage Russia has in the current war. So Russia by land is the largest nation in the world. And with that land comes a lot of commodities and natural resources. So Russia's top exports include gold, you got natural gas, you got crude oil, you got iron, you got coal, and you also have frozen fish and a bunch of other things. So when nations try to sanction Russia, they're cutting all those commodities and natural resources off from the global economy. So you will affect the Russian economy a lot, but there's gonna be second order effects on the global economy as well. And you can't ignore that. You can see this in the price of commodities rising. Just look at the price of wheat. Now take a look at oil. How about natural gas? What about iron? These are all major exports of the Russian economy. And these are all major commodities that the global economy needs. So you have to ask who's been benefiting from the sharp rise in commodities. It's not been the countries importing them. So it must be Russia. Now look at the Russian ruble when measured in US dollars. It took a sharp nosedive when they declared war, but now the price is recovering and actually gaining against the dollar. So it could be that Russia's economy and ruble are backed by their commodity trade. And now you have to consider that Russia is pricing some of their top exports, like energy, in rubles. So nations that need those commodities will need to buy rubles to get them. And this will increase the demand for rubles. And on top of that, all central banks worldwide are debasing their currencies like crazy. Whenever countries debase their currencies, guess what happens? The price of hard assets and commodities skyrocket. So in the current geopolitical landscape, Putin has a lot of power here. And he also may have learned this from one of his heroes, Peter the Great. When Peter was the Tsar of Russia around the early 1700s, he built the city of St. Petersburg, which Putin had grown up in. He also did something no other leader in Russia had done before. So when Peter went to the West, he was pretty much looking for ideas and knowledge to bring back to Russia. And that's exactly what he did. When Peter first came into power, he had pretty much no factories from Russia. And when he died, there were over 233 factories. When Peter went to the West, he came to a realization that it was wise for a nation to produce what it uses. And on top of that, he also realized that if you're a nation, you want to import as little as possible and export as much as possible. Economist James Mavers describes how Peter made Russia into a dominant world power. He realized that the resources of Russia were enormous, that these had scarcely been touched, and that in time, the industry would yield large returns. Peter understood that it was wise for a nation to do that over 300 years ago. And Putin understands that today. So now with global supply chains disrupted and everything going pretty much downwards, that realization is extremely important. And now you got import heavy nations like the United States finally coming to that realization. But unfortunately for them, it's hard to steer a ship in a new direction when it's already sinking. So you can find a ton of these similarities between Putin and Peter. But the thing that really stuck out to me was this quote from Peter. Europe is necessary to us for some decades and afterwards we will show it our back. Now, looping back to Putin's early presidency, things seem to be going really well. At the same time that he's doing all this, Russia is still trying to figure out its identity. Do we use Soviet era symbols? Do we use pre-Soviet symbols? And this is a tough decision. Communism has been horrible and ended in disaster. But before the Soviet Union, they had Tsars who were like emperors. And they were pretty horrible too. The Russian aristocracy was fabulously wealthy, while the peasantry was horribly impoverished and oppressed, it was basically like slavery. So the prominent form of slavery back then in Russia was called debt slavery. It was said that noblemen would call people into their houses and then give them liquor. And after about two or three glasses, the peasant or person would be willing to sign a lifelong contract. Pretty much a contract bounded by the weight of debt. These contracts were 
pretty hard to get out of. I mean, the peasant already made no reserves, and all of their income already went to the government or their landowner. So they were pretty much sentenced to that contract for the rest of their lives. You can see these conditions clearly when looking back just a hundred years. Men from Uzbekistan, which was once part of the Soviet Union, were held in prison for not paying their taxes to the government or debt to other people. These people were allowed outside of prison to work until they had repaid what they owe. So looking back then does not seem like a great option either. So where do you turn? Do you just come up with entirely new symbols? Well, Putin makes the wise decision to just sort of embrace all of it. It might seem contradictory to embrace the styling both of the Tsars and the people who brutally murdered the Tsars and their whole family, but it actually made sense to a lot of people. It was all a part of Russian history. He was saying we're not Tsarists, we're not Soviets, we're Russians. He embraced all of Russian history, and the people liked that. The people used to belong to a huge Soviet Union that used to be powerful, and then it collapsed. So he gave them a sense of identity. For the first time, Russians were getting exposed to Western media, and they're seeing Russians painted as the bad guys. And in the midst of all that, Putin says we're going to be proud of our history and who we are. Before Putin, Yeltsin had been embarrassed by both their Soviet and pre-Soviet past. He didn't want to embrace any of it, but Putin embraces all of it. And in doing so, he allows people to believe in themselves and believe in Russia. Putin, he really mastered this skill throughout his career. Inspiring somebody is one way to get them to like you, but then on top of that, if you give them an identity, they'll be willing to defend that identity pretty much at all costs. In Putin's eyes, the history of Russia and Ukraine intertwine, creating a rope stronger than most can imagine. He sees a shared history starting in the 7th century during the rise of the trading cities along the Dnieper River. The most important city of that time was Kiev, which is the current capital of Ukraine. He ties an identity between the people of Ukraine and Russia, saying, quote, Millions of those born in Ukraine who now live in Russia, we see them as our own close people. He goes on to point out that the Russian and Ukrainian people are one people, quote, Together we have always been and will be many times stronger and more successful, for we are one people. It's not like this is out of the ordinary either. People, they inherently like to believe that they're important because of their identity. And Putin, he's giving them that. So you really have to ask yourself the question, what makes up your identity? And would you be willing to defend your identity if it was under attack? I would argue most people would answer yes to that last question. Vladimir Putin's approval rating is soaring despite his disastrous invasion of Ukraine. So back when Putin was first elected, he caters directly to the Russian people's identity, and it makes him immensely popular. But the good times don't last forever. In 2003, the economy is no longer growing quite as quickly as it used to, and there's an increasing number of terrorist attacks. And between the terrorism, the Chechnya war, and the slowing growth of the economy, some people start to think that Putin might be somewhat vulnerable. Not vulnerable enough to actually lose re-election, but maybe they could put some checks on him. There's this Russian billionaire named Khodorkovsky, and he has this vision for an open, free, democratic Russia. So he starts funding opposition leaders in Russia's parliament, which is known as the Duma. So Putin wouldn't be up for re-election, but there would be an election to see if his party would win in the Duma, and Khodorkovsky figures this is his chance to make a splash. So he's funding candidates and flying around, attending events, and giving speeches. Well, that's not a good idea. It turns out Putin was not open to being challenged and having meaningful opposition. So he has Kordidovsky jailed and he seizes his business. The Russian people actually love this. They don't get too caught up in the details, they just think he's sticking it to the oligarchs. They didn't like these guys who had, in their view, gotten unfairly rich and were now billionaires. So jailing Kordikovsky actually bumps Putin's popularity before the parliamentary election. You can see Putin resurrecting this tactic by throwing opposition leader Alexei Navalny into a maximum security prison for nine years. For those of us climbing to the top of the food chain, there can be no mercy. There is but one rule. Hunt 
or be hunted. So if you've ever played the game of Agario, you'll know exactly how this power game works. If you're a large dot, you're always going to eat the smaller dots trying to take your power. It takes a lot of skill, strategy, and luck to get to a top position, and you'll fight really hard to keep that position. So like Frank Underwood says, if you're not being the hunter, you will become the hunted. Going back to 2003, Putin doesn't want to leave anything to chance, so he rigs the election. And unsurprisingly, his party wins handily. And for Putin, things were about to get worse in Russia. September 1st is the traditional first day of school. It's called Day of Knowledge, where parents and grandparents join their children on the first day of school. On September 1st, 2004, the local school in Belsan, which is pretty close to Chechnya, was full of new students and parents. The day started out normal, with teachers, students, and parents meeting and celebrating. And then at 9am, about 40 masked men ran onto the school grounds, firing AK-47s in the air, and herding 800 people into the school gymnasium. They demanded that Russian troops pull out of Chechnya and grant it complete independence. Of course that was never going to happen. The Russian military set up a perimeter and besieged the school for over three days. At the same time, they were trying to negotiate with the terrorists. These terrorists were not messing around. On the first day, they started killing people and throwing their bodies out of the gymnasium. The Russian military would intermittently hear gunfire and explosions go off inside the gymnasium, but not wanting to make the situation worse, they didn't act. And then finally, on the third day, all hell broke loose. There were two massive explosions inside the gymnasium. Hostages started trying to escape through the holes in the walls created by these explosions. And then the terrorists started firing at the escaping hostages. Government forces returned fire, and it devolved into a 10-hour gunfight. When the smoke cleared, 333 hostages were dead, 186 of them being children. In addition, 10 Russian commandos and 30 terrorists were killed. This was a political disaster for Putin, so what would you do in this situation? Would you apologize for the deaths of hundreds of Russians and hope the political hit wasn't too severe? Well, Putin actually manages to turn this situation into a positive. He flies down to Belsan and gives a speech televised to the whole country. In it, he doesn't apologize or accept responsibility. He just reflects on the nature of Russia as a whole. He basically says, hey, this kind of crap didn't happen when Russia was strong. If Russia is strong again, we won't have to deal with this anymore, and I'm going to make it strong again. People accept this, and rather than the Belsan debacle dragging him down, Putin's popularity once again goes up. You might be wondering, what are these reforms that are going to strengthen Russia? Is he going to beef up the military and improve intelligence services? No. The solution was to remove the last semblance of representative democracy in Russia. Ten days after the siege, Putin abolished elections for governors and mayors, as he would now be appointing all of them. 2004 marked the end of democratic rule in Russia, and the beginning of Putin's complete control. However, we still haven't reached the peak of Putin's power and influence. While major media outlets were not too critical of him, there were still individuals who could investigate, report, and become whistleblowers to non-Russian media. That changed on October 7, 2006, when Anna Politkovskaya, an investigative journalist who had been highly critical of Putin, was shot dead in her apartment building. About six weeks later, Alexander Litvinenko, a Russian emigrant who was friends with Anna, died of a mysterious illness. An investigation soon after revealed that he had been poisoned with a rare and very deadly radioactive isotope. As you might expect, Putin vigorously denied any involvement in their deaths. He argued that they weren't causing him any real problems, and now that they're dead, they're causing him even more problems because everybody thinks he did. The fact is, Putin did have something to gain from their assassinations. Taking control of television stations only gets you so far in terms of controlling the national conversation. So yes, maybe the deaths did cause him some short-term problems, but they also created an environment where individuals were afraid to speak out against Putin for fear of what might happen to them. 
Most people really don't understand how vital information is in the current Ukraine war. You gotta ask yourself, who controls the algorithms that send out information to millions and billions of people? It's certainly not Putin, so of course he bans all Western social media. There's a good quote from novelist Tom Clancy that describes why nation states like to censor information. If you control the information, you control the people. And so that's exactly what Putin does. He uses the tentacles of the Russian state to grab onto the information that he likes while suffocating the information he disagrees with. While Putin's grip on information in Russia was reaching new heights, his official political control was about to end. In Russia's constitution, presidents were limited to two terms, and so he wouldn't be able to run again in 2008. He had to pick a successor. The successor he ended up choosing was a very mild-mannered bureaucrat by the name of Dmitry Medvedev. So Medvedev gets up and surprises everyone by saying he's nominating Vladimir Putin as prime minister. There are some mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, Medvedev legitimately seemed like a new kind of leader, one that could usher in real progress in terms of ending corruption, allowing a free and open press, and extending friendly relations to the West. On the other hand, with Putin taking on the second most powerful position in the country, watching over Medvedev's every move, people thought things really wouldn't change. So the people, they were anxious to see what would happen. Well, Medvedev is elected president in 2008, and Putin becomes prime minister. And early on, it seemed like there was a glimmer of hope that Medvedev might be truly independent of Putin, and he might be able to act on his own. But then those hopes were squashed in just a matter of months. The turning point occurred in the summer of 2008, when the country of Georgia commenced an attack on the region of South Ossetia, a region of Georgia. So this is the Georgian military invading another region of Georgia, kind of like the Russians going into Chechnya. The big difference is that South Ossetia is a province mostly ethnically Russian, and that had sought to distance itself from Georgia and strengthen its ties with Russia. So the Georgian government feels they're losing control of this region. Well, when Georgia finally does attack, the Russian commander near the area calls Medvedev and says, what do you want me to do? So what does Medvedev do when he gets this call? He calls Putin. But there's one problem. Putin's at the Beijing Olympics and he can't be reached. So after trying to call him for four hours, Medvedev has to make a decision. And finally, he comes to the decision that he's sending in the troops. But when Putin finally finds out about this, he was enraged by Medvedev's indecisiveness. Putin was actually the first to make a statement at the Olympics stating that Russia would respond with force. He claimed that Russian citizens living in Georgia needed to be protected. So Russia sends in troops to invade and control South Ossetia. They don't have a lot of trouble with the Georgian military, and to this day, South Ossetia is a semi-autonomous region that Georgia claims is still theirs, but Russia actually governs. After that, Putin publicly maintained the charade that Medvedev was the commander-in-chief, but privately he ridiculed him and he took full control of the country. Now at that point, Putin kind of realized handing over power was pointless, and he orchestrated the rewriting of the Constitution to change his presidential term to six years and allow him to serve four additional terms. And in 2012, Putin returned to the presidency and has been serving in that capacity ever since. So let's take a look at two other things, his personal wealth and how he's been able to shape international events, including war. Putin has constructed a massive residence on the Black Sea. It looks like a royal palace that could have been built 300 years ago. It's a massive complex. It's got a theater, a church, swimming pools, heliports, parks, and apartments for his bodyguard. The estimated cost to construct it was $1 billion. So Putin must have at least $1 billion if he built himself a $1 billion home, right? Well, no. Technically, he didn't build it, and technically, he doesn't own it. It's owned by an oligarch billionaire who is very close to Putin and depends on him for his fortune. And yet, by all accounts, it is Putin's private residence. It's one of 20 that he owns. And technically, he doesn't need to own it on paper. He just needs to have the power to enforce it. He runs and pretty much owns the Russian government. 
And on top of that, he has a bunch of oligarch friends that will do his bidding for him. And if they don't do his bidding for him, they risk being at the will of his power. Money is the McMansion in Sarasota that starts falling apart after 10 years. Power is the old stone building that stands for centuries. So since Putin has so much power, he basically has as much money as he wants. But rather than getting a lot of money early, it's been little by little and it took a while for people to notice. But now there are billions of dollars at his access in terms of international relations. In 2004 and 2005, he attempted an intervention in Ukraine to install a president who would be loyal to Russia, and it backfired terribly. Since then, Putin has done a number of things remarkably well and learned from that experience. The first is to take advantage of the international dissatisfaction with the United States. At first, Putin's relationship with the U.S. was very complex, and he even opened a welcoming arm during the September 11th terrorist attacks on the U.S. That changed when President Bush failed to listen to his objections and built anti-missile bases in the Czech Republic and Poland, and also when he invaded Iraq. That hostility has only solidified over the years as Putin has realized that many countries are dissatisfied with the USA and intimidated and frightened that no one can really do anything to stop the US. There are a ton of reasons why nations might not like the United States, but a big reason is because the United States was the global superpower for the past 80 years. Towards the end of World War II, most nations' currencies were sharply devalued. And of course, during that war, the United States came out on top. So what those nations do is they go to the United States and peg their currency to the United States currency. And on top of that, the United States currency is pegged to gold. This is called the Bretton Woods Agreement. You really have this Bretton Woods Agreement that formulates. And what it does it, is it puts the United States at the base layer of the global monetary system. This only lasted 27 years until 1971, when the United States no longer had enough gold to maintain redemption for its dollars. So the gold standard for most of the world ended. After the Bretton Woods Agreement fell apart, the world moved towards today's petrodollar system. The biggest benefit from the petrodollar system, as analyst Luke Roman argues, is that it contributed to the United States Cold War victory over the Soviet Union during the 1970s and 1980s. The agreement and military buildup to enforce it was a strong chess move by the US to gain influence over the Middle East and its resources. The petrodollar system made it so you could only use dollars to buy oil imports around the world, and so countries globally hold a combination of dollars, gold, and other major currencies as reserves, with an emphasis on dollars. This system gives the United States a really big geopolitical influence because it can sanction any country and cut them off from the global dollar system everybody uses. This is exactly what the United States did to Russia after they attacked Ukraine. The system also gave the United States the ability to create tons of foreign military bases worldwide. So this would be like having a bully in school and he always gets what he wants and always has his best interest in mind. And then next thing you know you graduate and you got a new job. Now that same bully is your boss. And then you go buy a house with the money you got from your job and next thing you know the bully is your neighbor. So you can see, if you apply this to nation states, why smaller nation states would be mad or not very fond of the United States. The United States is just a bully. However, a fatal flaw lingers in the current petrodollar system. All of this demand for the dollar makes US exports more expensive and makes imports less expensive. And so the US began running structural trade deficits once we established the system totaling over $14 trillion in total deficits as of today. From 1944 to 1971, the U.S. drew down its gold reserves to maintain the Bretton Woods dollar system, whereas from 1974 to present, the U.S. instead drew down its industrial base to maintain the petrodollar system. So that petrodollar system is starting to crack under its own weight. The United States can only import so much before it starts feeling consequences. And on top of that, because of the petrodollar system, you pretty much globalized imports for the United States. 
So we would rely on China while hollowing out our own industrial base. Foreigners take their persistent dollar surpluses and buy productive U.S. assets with them like stocks, real estate, and land. In other words, the U.S. sells its appreciating financial assets in exchange for depreciating consumer goods. So this is exactly what Russia, China, and many other countries are doing. As the demand for U.S. exports weakens, the demand for Russian exports strengthens. So with these profits from the exports, Russia can either take those profits and invest back into their industries, or they can buy hard assets. Like I said earlier, Russia's vast supply of exports and commodities is one thing to keep in mind, but it's also just as important to keep in mind that a larger and larger portion of the world is increasingly relying on them. Between December 2020 and December 2021, exports of Russia have increased by $20 billion, or 57.3%, while imports increased by only $5.2 billion, or 21.4%. And this is primarily because the petrodollar system incentivizes Russia to export more than they import. So Putin has set himself up as the USA's main opponent and used the failing petrodollar system to his advantage. It's made him really popular both at home and in many other places that are not satisfied with the United States. And to all my fellow Americans out there, you might have ignored what I just said. But it's really important to realize we are also trapped inside of an information bubble where we only see the positive coverage of the United States. This clip I'm about to show you is of a primetime news anchor in India, and it's really eye-opening. Joe Biden has become totally delusional. The Saudi crown prince is refusing to take Biden's calls, and he has the temerity to say that India is being shaky. Biden is begging the Venezuelans to give him a little bit of extra oil, but he says that India is on shaky ground. And we made it clear to the Americans that the only corner that we are in is the Indian corner. By refusing to ally completely with a shaky America, India will not clean up America's mess. They have littered the whole world over the decades with their war machine. It's not just India that takes this stance, it's other nations as well. For more perspective, there's this map showing the number of countries that sanctioned Russia after the war. I'm sure it's not as many nations as you thought. So really the foundations of the current petrodollar system, which keeps the United States at the foundation of the monetary system, is breaking apart. And when the bully starts to look a little weak, the kids that were bullied will start to rise up. Now let's get back to Putin. His high watermark for international influence came in the Syrian civil war. In 2011, fighting broke out in Syria. A coalition of rebels were fighting against the Syrian government and sometimes against each other. The US was covertly supporting the rebels and Putin decided to strongly support the government in charge of Syria. He not only funded and provided arms to the Syrian government, but he embedded Russian troops with the Syrian troops. And this put the US in a very difficult situation. If the US wanted to help the rebels by bombing the Syrian government forces, they might accidentally bomb Russian troops who are with them. Are they willing to start World War III over Syria? You can see this same situation today. Is the United States willing to start World War III over Ukraine? Now when people call Vladimir Putin the most powerful man in the world, and more than a few have, this is what they're talking about. If he can defeat the United States in a Syria proxy war and keep his favored regime in charge there, who can credibly claim to be more powerful than that? Not to mention he's doing a similar playbook in Ukraine. If the US or NATO gets involved, that automatically starts World War III. He knows that, and it's leverage he can use to get what he wants. So in a broad sense, this is the entire chess game that Putin is playing. And it involves thousands of moving parts and pieces. There are many other pieces that I didn't cover, like Russia's decreasing young male population, Ukraine finding oil and gas reserves that could threaten Russia's energy market, the entrenchment of Russian gas pipelines throughout Europe, and the previous turmoil in the Donbass and Crimea regions of Ukraine. Putin's pitch to the Russian people has never been, I will do the right thing or the moral thing. It has always been, I will do what's best for you. So he mainly uses three things to get people to believe him. Project power, inspire pride, and be a trusted voice. 
After that, he just has to give people the ability to believe him and his story. And to end this video, I'm gonna leave you with something I found really interesting when researching. So, at least currently, there's a really popular media narrative that Putin's going to lose the war, it's a failure, and that he's just drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm not gonna comment my opinion on the outcome of the war or what Putin will do next. Personally, I think it's foolish to comment on geopolitical events that have more outcomes than anyone can conceive of. It's not beginning the story that I fear. It's not knowing how it will end. Everyone is fair game now. But I will leave you with a passage written by economist James Maver in 1914. And I quote, From the time of Peter the Great until now, Russia has benefited rather by her defeats than by her victories. She has the Asiatic quality of resilience. She is never more to be feared than when she has just been beaten.